Hello there guys, I'm Unstable Voltage and welcome back to the second video in my Europa Universalis 4 tutorial series with the Common Sense DLC. In the last video I talked at length about the concepts of the game, what you basically have to do, what the game is and what you should do to really just configure the game and get everything up and running and get it started. In this video I'm going to show you what the first steps you need to take are when you start your game for the very first time. So I've just selected France to get this game going. I've hit play and the game has loaded in and this is what you are greeted with. Now the first thing to check as soon as the game loads in is make sure that the game is paused. You should be able to see this red ribbon with paused in the top centre of the screen. You should also notice that the date in the top right of the screen shouldn't be moving. And the button in the top right hand corner, the little pause button, should also be red. If the game isn't currently paused, go ahead and pause it. Um, if any time has passed by, you might want to restart because there are quite a lot of things that you want to set up initially uh, before you unpause the game for the first time. You can also pause and unpause the game by hitting the space bar as well as clicking the button up in the top right hand corner. And you can adjust the game speed by using these plus and minus buttons next to the uh, pause button and you'll see these five little red pips that light up as you go from speed five four three two and one you can also use the plus and minus uh, keys on the numeric keypad which will go up and down through the game speeds as well obviously it doesn't have any effect while it is paused but you can adjust the speed uh, while the game is in the pause state now People play the game on different speeds. A lot of people tend to play around speed 3 most of the time. It seems to be the ideal speed. Uh, people tend to drop it down to speed 1 or 2 if they're in a pretty intense war because it just makes it a little bit easier to respond to enemy armies and being attacked. And people tend to play it on the faster speeds if... They're just waiting for time to pass because maybe they're waiting for their manpower or their money to recover. Maybe they're waiting for their army to train or buildings to be built. If you're at peace and there's not much risk of anything going on, bump it up to a high speed. What I will say is though, you can play at any speed you want. And particularly if you're a new player, I'd be tempted to keep the game on speed 1 or at the most speed 2. If you are going to bump the speed up and run it at a faster speed, make sure you keep one hand over the space bar so that you can be ready to pause if something should happen and give you the time to actually decide what you're going to do. So the first thing you'll notice when you look at the new game, it is very, very complex. The interface is very busy and there is a lot going on. I'm not going to go too much into all of the individual aspects on the interface on this video. We'll go through most of them as we come to them. So I'm going to go through this in the order of we're just starting a game. What do we need to do? What do we need to look at? One thing I would recommend doing is making sure you've got this thing here showing on the right hand side. This is called the outliner. If the outliner isn't showing you'll notice that there's this little uh, button that looks like it has a list on it and that is just beneath the pause button. It says outliner if you mouse over. If you right click that it will, uh, sorry if you left click it it will pop out. If you right click on the button you will see the list of options for it which you can also get to by clicking the little plus button here and that allows you to turn certain things on and off that are in the outliner leave it as it is for default should be fine uh, but this will give you a lot of useful information it does expand and shrink as it needs to but it's well worth having that open You'll also notice here at the top underneath the current date that we have your current score and your current position. Now obviously when you first start you might find that you don't have any score and your position will just be sort of some random number. Don't worry too much about that for now. Obviously the map is a little bit difficult to see. You can see the nation names if you move out. So scrolling around is quite easy. You can actually use the cursor keys. Uh, you can also uh, scroll if you move the mouse to the edge of the screen. You can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Uh, you can also use these little plus and minus buttons down next to the mini map in the bottom right hand corner. They will zoom in and out. And you can also hold down the middle mouse button and drag the map around. But it's very, very difficult to actually see where your nation is. So once again, we have the same list of map options that we had before we uh, picked our nation. So if we hit the W key or click the little blue flag button down here above the mini map, that will put the game into the political map mode and we will instantly be able to see where the nations are by colour. If we zoom in, the nation name disappears and we see the province names. If we zoom out a little bit, the province names disappear and we see the individual nations. If for any reason... The political map mode isn't on key W or it isn't the second icon in the list up here. 
go ahead and click this little uh, arrow that points to the left which says more map modes and with that open then you should find the button in the right position. The reason it may have moved, it shouldn't do if this is the first time that you've played the game, uh, but what you can do is you can actually reassign um, these map modes. So I've just unticked the political map mode with a right click and ticked the opinion map mode with a right click. If I move that screen away, you will now see that this second icon becomes the opinion map mode. And if I hit the W key, it will go to the opinion map mode. So if somebody's been messing around with your interface or you've been messing around yourself and you can't find those particular um, that particular map mode, uh, you will always be able to find it if you pull the map mode drawer open. You could also lock the map mode drawer with the little padlock, which means when you select a map mode, it won't automatically uh, minimize back down to the mini map. I'm going to go through these map modes in another video because there are a lot of them. So you've got your mini map down there as well as your map modes. Uh, you've also got some useful buttons along here at the bottom. I'm not going to talk about every, everything here because some of it is specific to certain countries. We'll cover it in due course. But you've got your menu uh, options, which is just hitting escape. It's the same thing. Um, we'll ignore the ledger for now. You've got history, which basically just gives you some flavor about your country and lists everything you've done to date. Um, Triggered modifiers you don't ever really need to worry about. It's a bit more of an advanced thing. Basically, there are certain events that can go on in the world um, if you uh, trigger certain things like controlling certain provinces. Most of the time, it's not something you ever need to worry about unless you're achievement hunting. One useful thing down here in the bottom right-hand corner is find province. Uh, you can also get to that by hitting the F key on the keyboard. Very, very useful if you want to find a specific province. You can just start to type the name in, click on the button, and it will take you to that province. Nice and easy. Good way to find something if you can't find it. The one that I skipped out, the ledger, you can also get to by pressing L. Um, this is a very, very useful thing because it basically lists a lot of information uh, about the game and all of the different countries. So I'm playing as France. If I want to know how big England's navy is, I can click on military, I can click on navies, I can scroll down, find England, and I can instantly see that England have seven heavy ships, 11 light ships, nine transports. They have a total of 27 ships. They're allowed to have a maximum of 33, although that's not a hard cap. You can go over that, but there is an option in the options menu before you start the game where you can lock the ledger. Normally used for multiplayer because if you lock the ledger it means people can't spy and see how big your army is. Uh, but the ledger is quite useful for a lot of information. You can also find some useful information there such as uh, economy information, how much money someone's got coming in. You can also go into country and actually look at score comparison so you can find yourself in the list. Obviously we know we're 17th because we can see it up here. We are France, and we can see what makes up our total score and how much we get each month. So along the top here, you've got the main bar that shows you everything that you've got going on with your country. The first number here is the treasury, how much money you currently have. The money for every country is measured the same. It is in ducats. Uh, we have 237 and a half ducats in the bank here. So there are decimal points. If you mouse over, you'll actually get to see the decimal decimalization. The little green plus indicates that we're making money each month. If we were losing money, it would be a little red negative uh, symbol. And by massing over that, you can actually see where the money's going in and where the money's coming out. And this is used for a number of things such as purchasing buildings, maintaining your armies, um, paying people, war reparations and so on and so forth. Again, something we'll cover as we get to. Manpower is the available men that you have in your country or, or your nation who are of fighting age. These are the people that are available to create new regiments for your army and these are the people that are available to replace um, uh, dead soldiers within your army. So if you actually get your armies into a fight and people get killed or if you have your army somewhere where they take attrition and people just die from sort of the elements and starvation then it'll be people from your manpower pool that come to replace those. Manpower does um, regenerate over time. The amount of manpower you get each month is a percentage of your maximum. And again, as with everything in EU4, if you mouse over it, it actually tells you uh, all the values and where those things come from. You've also got your country stability. Normally starts at zero. It can go down to negative three and up to positive three. You generally want to keep this stability as high as you can. There are various different events and ways that you can do that. Again, we'll talk about it when we get to it. But general rule is um, zero stability is okay. 
Positive stability, really good. The higher, the better. Negative stability, bad. You always want to try and avoid negative stability. It hurts you economically and it can hurt you in other ways as well. Then you've got a thing here called prestige. Prestige is basically how your nation is viewed by the other nations and things that you can do like honouring an ally's um, call to defend them in a war um, or uh, winning battles. All of those sort of things increase your prestige and make your country look better. This is very, very useful uh, because as you can see at the bottom of the tooltip it does give you certain bonuses and benefits uh, but if you are somebody who is the leading partner in a personal union which basically means you have the same dynasty on the throne having a high prestige means you're far more likely to inherit that nation later on the next icon is legitimacy now it's legitimacy because i'm playing as france if i was playing as a republic then that would be Republican tradition. And if I was playing as a theocracy, then it would be... Um, I don't think it's faith, but there's another one. It's just recently been added and I can't remember what it is. But it works the same way pretty much... Um, regardless of what type of nation you are. Uh, the number can go from 0 to 100. And as with everything else, 0 is bad, 100 is good. And uh, it will give you the breakdown, if you mouse over, of what the benefits or penalties are for having that number as it is. And then finally, you've got your power projection, which everybody has. Your power projection is basically... How big, you, how big a stick you wave around at people. If you declare war on your enemies, if you take land away from your enemies, if you humiliate your enemies and your rivals, that will increase your power projection. And certain things, like as you can see in red there, there's a negative number. It says not enough rivals minus one, which is giving us minus three yearly because we don't have enough rivals, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, and as you can see, it tells us there that if we had 25 power projection, we could have another leader without upkeep. And if we had 50 power projection or more, we would get an extra admin, diplo and military monarch point each month. It's currently set at zero. We'll worry about that in a little while. These things here just show you some of the people that you have available to your nation. The first one is your merchants. So we do have two merchants, but it says zero of two. That's because they uh, are both currently uh, away on merchant missions. Normally, your merchants start in decent trade nodes, but we'll talk about trade in another video. Uh, colonists, you normally start with zero colonists until you pick up exploration or colonial ideas. Then you have your diplomats. Diplomats are very, very important in this game because you really do a lot of diplomacy. Whether you're playing as a warfaring nation or whether you're trying to play diplomatically, you will need your dipl uh, diplomats because pretty much every interaction you have with another nation requires a diplomat. And then you may have uh, a number of missionaries which can be used to change the uh, religion in a particular province if it's the wrong religion. Below that, we can see this ribbon that tells us what our current monarch points are. We have 84 in admin, 98 in diplo, and 82 in military. Now, these monarch points are used for a number of things. They can be used to increase the uh, output of a particular province. So each province has a, a certain development. So a province will have its base uh, tax development its uh, production development and its military power development and you can increase each one of these by spending admin points diplo points and military points respectively not something you need to worry about just now but they're also used for unlocking technologies so there are three different uh, technology trees there's the admin tech the diplo tech and the military tech and again they are unlocked by using these points um, there are also things called idea groups which you can pick up at, uh, when you reach a certain level of administrative techs and again there are administrative ideas diplomatic ideas and military ideas and you spend these points to unlock those as well you also use these points for other things for example if you take a province off somebody else and want to make it your own in a process called coring that uses admin points if you want to negotiate a peace deal with something and take uh, take something from somebody that will require diplomatic points if you want to force march your army somewhere or you want to hire yourself a military leader that will cost you military points now, the way these points work is you gain a certain amount each month. Normally, you have, if I mouse over admin, you can see here, we get a base value of three. 
So normally every nation will get three power points uh, in each one of these fields per month. Uh, we also, uh, if we look at admin, we're getting plus four from Charles VII's administrative skill. Well, that's our leader. If I just go and have a look at our leader, you can see his skill there again is four to four. So every month he adds four to the admin pool. He adds two to the Diplo pool, and he adds four to the military pool. You can also get some extra points here if you hire a administrative, diplomatic, or military advisor. Uh, they can go anywhere from plus one to plus three points as the maximum. There isn't a plus three one here that I can pick right now, but... We're not going to worry about the advisors uh, right just now, but uh, it's very, very important to um, get these uh, up as high as possible. Try not to waste them. As you can see, you can only keep 999 power. Um, I think if you're playing as some of the different uh, tech groups, that that might be slightly different, but you can find out what your cap is by mousing over it. If you reach the cap and you gain any more, it will be wasted. So that might be the time when you want to go into a nation. If there isn't a tech you can grab or anything, you might say, right, well, I'm almost at the cap on my military points. So let's go to one of my provinces and spend a little bit of military power to bump up the manpower or something like that. So that is the uh, the monarch points there. Um, over here we have the shield that represents our nation. So if we click on that, it brings open uh, this main window. This is the main interface where you will find most of the information uh, about your nation. All of these tabs along the top of this window can be controlled using the number keys on the main keyboard. So one, two, three, four, five, etc. Uh, below that, you'll also find you've got the production interface. If you click the little crossed hammer and sword, the first tab allows you to train your land units. The second tab is naval units. And then there's other information there like cores, missionaries, local autonomy. Uh, and again, these are things that we'll talk about as we uh, go through this series. Uh, you can also very, very quickly get to the units tab and the buildings tab by using the V and B key. So V will bring open the units tab and B will bring open the buildings tab. So it's always worth learning these little shortcuts. So just before we end, let's have a quick look at these things here. These things are very important. These are actually your um, notifications. They normally come in three different colors. You've got the green, which are the least important. Uh, there will be yellow, which you know need your attention but aren't super urgent and the red ones the red ones need to be dealt with pretty much straight away uh, there is a slight exception to the rule sometimes you'll see like a sort of an orangey colored flag with red borders uh, that normally means it's some sort of diplomacy invitation from one of your neighbors or something like that so I'm just going to go through the green ones first and just explain these to you because they're probably the most simple ones to go through. So the first one you'll often see is this little scroll with a red cross next to it. This says that we have no mission selected. Now if you mouse over any one of these uh, little flags you will see you've got some options. It says right click to dismiss and shift click to disable. Now if I was to go ahead and um, right click that to dismiss it, it goes away. Now I still don't have a mission selected. And that would eventually come back. Now, one thing you can do is if you go into the outliner options, you have an option to display disabled alert. So shift, uh, right clicking, it just makes it go away. If I was to shift and right click, that would disable it. But you can now see that on the outliner, it says disabled alerts, dis disputed succession. So we can click on that and put it back. If you dismiss an alert, the next time the event happens, the alert will come back. If you disable an alert, it, you will never see it again unless you re-enable it. So that's the difference there. So if I'd have clicked on that missions flag, it would have taken me here to missions and decisions, which is number seven. And what will happen is you will get a list of three missions. Normally, sometimes there's less, but you get a list of three missions to choose from. If you mouse over the little question mark, it will tell you what you have to do in order to complete that mission. So, for example, improving our prestige, we'd have to get our prestige to at least 50. It's currently only at number four. Or we could try and get the um, Papal State's opinion of us to be at least 100. Or we could drive England out of France by having to complete a various number of things. And as you can see, there are three little green asterisks there and only one red cross, which means three of those things are already true and one is not. So we are at peace with Great Britain because Great Britain doesn't exist. We are at peace with England. Um, not one province in the French 
region is not owned by Great Britain. But the one that isn't true is not one province in the French region is not owned by England. And that's because these provinces here are in the French region and they are owned by England. So if we, we could take all four of those provinces away from England, uh, five actually, because there's Calais there as well, of course. If we could take all of those provinces away from England, we would complete that mission. In order to complete a mission, you first have to select a mission. And the if you mouse over the little envelope, it'll actually tell you what you get uh, as a reward for completing the mission. You can cancel a mission at any time. If you cancel a mission, you cannot choose another mission for another year. Um, once you complete a mission, you can choose a new mission instantly. You also have these national decisions on the same screen, but again, that's something we'll cover in another video. Let's just have a look at the rest of these tabs. Disputed successions isn't something that we're going to get into right now, but this is basically uh, what happens when a country has an heir to the throne who has a weak claim, and it's possible that somebody else could try and claim the throne from them. So this will basically show you all of the countries who have heirs with um, without a good claim. So a good claim, a high claim, would be 100. And as you can see... Um, well, these are actually showing you the prestiges. Countries with more prestige are going to be harder to claim the throne than a country with low prestige. And as you can see, this lists all the country with low prestige. Uh, next, you've got the little hammer and saw. That shows us that we can actually build certain buildings in places. It's telling us if we mouse over that we can build a castle in three more provinces. If we click on that, it will just open the buildings tab. So we're not going to be too bothered about doing that that icon will show up anytime you have enough money to build a building and anytime you've got a province that has an open building slot and doesn't have a particular building that you're capable of building so you'll see this pop up quite often most of the time we ignore it the little empty chair says that we have a free advisor slot in fact we don't only have a free advisor slot we have all three of our advisor slots free now, as I said, having an advisor will mean that you actually gain an extra one, two or three points in that particular monarch uh, PowerPoint every month. What you've got to remember with these guys is they do cost money. They cost a certain amount of money to hire and then they also have a monthly salary as well. So by the time you've got um, three of these guys, if we actually look here, if we mouse over the treasury, in fact, there's an easier way to see this. We can click on the little economy tab here, which is number three, the little pouch with the coins next to it. We can actually see that we are making a total of 2.17 ducats per month. So if we were to go ahead and hire all three level one advisors, and level one advisors all cost one ducat per month, that means we'd be paying out an extra three ducats a month and we'd be making a loss. So very often, what you may want to do is avoid getting an advisor early on. Advisors are really useful because they do give you other bonuses. So for example, looking at the military advisors here, we can see this level one guy would also give our armies an extra 10% morale. If we go back and look at the diplomatic advisors, we can see that this guy would give us an extra 10% power to our spy offence, and that this guy would give us an extra plus one modifier to our diplomatic reputation. If we go and look at the admin guys, we can see that this guy would give us 10% to our production efficiency. Now, this is a level two guy, but he'd give us um, a 0.1%. Uh, in inflation reduction every year some of them do pay for themselves so for example the production efficiency guy that extra 10 percent production might be enough to actually cover his monthly fee so it does depend now most of the time you only have three advisors to choose from in each category um, bear in mind you also want to keep an eye on their age because older ones are more likely to die sooner. And obviously, if you've paid a lot of money for that person to join your court, you don't want to spend out money and then have them die very, very soon. You will find that the younger ones actually cost more to hire. So if we look at both of these guys, because they're both uh, level two, the guy who's 38 years old costs more to hire than the guy who's 59. And that's just because he is 
closer to dying, basically. He's not going to last as long. Their monthly retainer is the same. Sometimes you get certain events which give you a fourth advisor choice. If you find that none of these advisors are to your liking and you might want to see if you can get a better option, you can go ahead and retire them. To retire an advisor, it actually costs their uh, full hiring price, but it will actually uh, get rid of them and somebody new will come and take their place. But the most important thing for now, which is where we are going to uh, end this video after talking about this, is this one, too few rivals. So each country, if we click on that, has to have a number of rivals. Now if you ever see this screen, which is the diplomacy screen, which is number two on the, um, the keypad, which is not going to work for me now because I don't have the window open, but it's number two, that's diplomacy. And if you ever find that this is not showing the country you're playing as, right now it is, it says France, and it also set, it's got my icon there, but let's just say, for example, that it was showing England, and I've got to that by just right-clicking on one of England's provinces. So left-click on a province opens the province panel, right-click on a province opens the diplomacy panel for that nation. So this is showing England. Even if I go back into that screen, it will still show England. You can get back to your own country by right-clicking on your own province, or you can click the button down here on the bottom of the window that says View Your Country, and that will actually go back to you. So you can see here that I actually have four enemies. That means there are four different countries that have rivaled me. If we mouse over them, we can see who they are. England has rivaled me, Burgundy has rivaled me, Provence has rivaled me, and Aragon has rivaled me. Now there are several reasons that you want to have rivals. You have better spy effectiveness against rivals, which means if you want to make claims on their provinces, it is done more quickly against your rivals. You can also embargo the trade of any nation, but embargoing trade actually gives you a trade efficiency penalty. However, if you embargo a rival, there's no penalty to the trade efficiency for doing that. Uh, you also get a reduced diplomatic cost if you want to take uh, anything away from a rival that is unjustified. And there's one other modifier as well that I can't remember off the top of my head. But Oh, uh, increased, presti increased uh, power projection from taking stuff from them. Because you want to get this power projection up. And as you can see, we're actually losing power projection because we don't have enough rivals. So we need to decide who we want to rival. And as you can see, we can have three. All of these rivals are currently uh, currently empty. This actually, actually gives me the, uh, the list there. So 25% more prestige from defeating them in battles. No trade efficiency penalty when embargoing. Plus 20% spy offence against them. And minus 33% diplomatic power cost for demanding provinces from them in a peace deal. Now, it's very tempting just to click on these and go, right, I'm going to pick the people that are already um, rivaling me. Now, you can't rival just anybody. You can only rival people who are relatively close and who are of a approximate power. So you can't just go ahead and rival somebody who's really, really tiny and weak or somebody who is miles away. Once you click on the... Um, the embargo or the rival button here, you will actually see a list of all of the possible rivals you can have. It shows you what their opinion is of you. So a yellow number means they're indifferent towards you, a green number means they like you somewhat, a red number means they genuinely dislike you. You can also see the size of their army and navy. So if we actually look here, you see for army, most of these numbers are uh, green uh, and they're negative, which basically means that... Um, their armies are weaker. So Austria's army is 46% stronger than ours, so it shows in red. But England's army is 8% weaker than ours, so it shows in green. Same goes for the navy. As you can see, Aragon, Castile and England have, England's army is 220% better than ours. Now, before you just go ahead and randomly start rivaling people, you do want to start thinking about um, the uh, uh, enemies of my enemy. Certainly plays a big part in this game. So if we look at England, for example, we can actually go ahead and, uh, well, we can also get to England by just clicking on their flag. We can go ahead and look at England and see that Aragon and Burgundy have rivaled England. Well, Aragon and Burgundy have rivaled us as well, so we're not going to find any friends there. If we go ahead and look at Burgundy, we can see that Austria has rivaled Burgundy. Now, Austria has rivaled Burgundy 
but Austria hasn't rivaled us. They're rivaling Burgundy, Venice and Aragon. They're also rivaling Aragon. And Aragon is one of our rivals. So Aragon rival us, Burgundy rival us, and Austria rivals both Burgundy and Aragon. So we don't want to rival Austria. We want to be Austria's friend. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to right click on Austria, which brings up Austria's diplomacy panel. We're going to look down this list and we are going to open the alliance actions. And one of the things you'll see there is offer alliance. Now, if it's greyed out, it might be because you don't have a free diplomat. Currently, we have two, so that's fine. They're both free. And a green tick shows us that they're most likely to accept. And we can actually see that by mousing over. It says they have 71 positive reasons for accepting an alliance and only six negative reasons for not accepting an alliance, which in total gives us 65 positive reasons for an alliance. And it gives you the breakdown beneath that to show you how that works out. So I can go ahead and click offer alliance there. Shows me how likely they are to accept. And I'm going to click send. Now, that instantly sends my diplomat over to them. And my diplomat is now away. It's going to take him 10 days to get back. So they arrive instantly, but they take a certain amount of time to return. But Austria should accept that alliance. If we also go in and have a look at Aragon, for example. Aragon are also being rivaled by Castile. Well, Castile isn't my rival either. So let's go in and offer the alliance to Castile as well. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm definitely going to want to rival England. We're probably never going to be friends with them. They absolutely hate me. Um, they have a casus belli against me, which basically means a reason for war. They have justification to attack me. We've got border fiction because they have provinces with borders that touch my provinces. We are also competing great powers, and they want my provinces. They want Armagné down here, and that gives us a big negative modifier. So let's go ahead and rival England. We're also going to choose our second rival. Let's go ahead and choose Burgundy, because they're my direct neighbour, and they're going to be a complete pain. And we also are going to choose Aragon as well, because they're also my di direct neighbour and a complete pain. So now all three of them are chosen, you'll see that the not enough rivals info goes away. I'm just going to unpause the game by pressing spacebar. Going to let a day or two tick by. And I'm just going to instantly hit space. And you'll see we have two pop-ups. Uh, Austria has accepted our offer for an alliance. And Castile has accepted an offer for an alliance. Now, we've also had one of these other flags pop up. This is one that I spoke about before, where you might see this sort of orange flag with the red borders. This is a, a diplomatic um, offer from another nation. This is Navarra, which is this little one province minor down here between Castile and Aragon. And they're actually offering me an alliance. I'm going to say no for the time being because I don't think they're going to be all that useful. So I'm just going to right click it to make it go away. Um, and uh, now we have our alliances. Now what we can do now is if we actually click this map mode here, the diplomatic map mode, which we can access by uh, the Y key. It's also the little, uh, the white dove. That actually shows us our own nation in green and our allies now show in blue. There's a random little province there because that belongs to Austria. That's uh, Sungdao there, but belongs to Austria. And you also see that some of these provinces actually have green lines on them. That means they belong to somebody else because these provinces actually belong to uh, England. But we, as France, have a core on them. We say that these provinces belong to us. They're rightfully ours. They're part of our nation. But England currently has control of them. So that's what those green lines mean. Now, just before we end, because this video has gone on for quite a while, one thing that it is re worth remembering is that each nation has a limited number of relationships that it can have. So as France, and again, if we go to the diplomacy screen, we can see here that we have a maximum of four diplomatic relations. And we're currently using three of them. We have our alliance with Austria, and we have our alliance with Castile. And we're also guaranteeing the independence of Scotland. Now, anything, any relationship you have with another nation will use up one of these relationship slots. So if you have uh, an alliance, 
if you have a royal marriage, if you're transferring trade power, if you are in a personal union, if it is a vassal, if you have military access, uh, or if you're offering uh, offering receiving, if you're receiving military access from someone, it's a relationship. If you're giving military access to somebody, it isn't a relationship. But all of those things count towards it. Now, you can go over your maximum relationship slots. It's not a hard cap. I could have 10 out of 4 if I wanted. But for every one over you go, it will deduct a... Dip, uh, a diplomatic monarch point per month. So currently I'm getting plus seven diplo power a month. If I was to go up to four, uh, if I was to go up to five out of four relations, then I would only be getting six diplomatic power per month because I'd lose one for being over that cap. So you can go over it, but most of the time you want to stay at that cap or under that cap. There are a few options that we could also offer to our allies. Uh, because we are playing as a kingdom, we have the option to uh, get into a royal marriage. If we go ahead and open, if we right click on one of these nations, say Castile for example, and we open the dynastic actions tab, uh, we'll actually see there's an option here for a royal marriage. Now, currently it's greyed out. And the reason that it's greyed out, there's actually two reasons. First of all, once you've sent a diplomat to a nation, you have to wait 30 days before you can send another. So we can't send another diplomat until the 12th of December 1444. So I'm just going to unpause the game and let time tick on. And also, we don't have any diplomats to send because both of our diplomats are currently in transit and they are travelling back. So I'm just going to hit plus a couple of times, just speed the game up. Remember, this isn't going to be a full playthrough, so as I do these videos, I will be skipping around from one nation to another. But uh, as soon as we hit the uh, the right date, you'll see that button light up. There it goes. I'm just going to pause again. So this is lit up. You can see that they will accept the royal marriage, and it shows us why. And if we go ahead and make that offer, as you can see, by getting into this royal marriage, it will actually reduce our legitimacy by minus three. Well, here's our legitimacy up here. It's currently at 100. This will reduce it by minus three when signing the deal due to their inferior prestige and legitimacy. So if they had a higher prestige and legitimacy, legitimacy, it wouldn't be quite so bad. Having one royal marriage will give us the following effects. We'll get plus 0.1 yearly legitimacy. We will get plus 1% improvement of relations and it'll give us 5% chance of having a new heir each month i think that is so we can go ahead and send that offer we can also go ahead and do the same thing with um austria now there are some nations that you won't be able to royal marry if you go ahead and find nations that are republics republics don't have the royal marriage option as you can see they they have a minus 1000 negative modifier because of their government forms this means they can't actually have a royal marriage their government form does not allow royal marriages as they lack a monarchy so some of these things are dependent on the type of nation that you are playing so yeah you'll see that the legitimacy has gone down but we will actually be gaining additional prestige. Did we get that royal marriage with Austria? Did it go through? Yeah. So you can break royal ties with people later on. But again, that's something we'll talk about in another video. This video has gone on more than long enough. But these are basically some of the steps that you have to do when you very first get started, before you even really unpause the game, and it's just going through, working out who your enemies are going to be, and working out who will be powerful friends to help you fight those enemies. Even as the more powerful countries, you definitely want to make sure that you keep some friends, because just having them around will make your enemies less likely to attack you, it will mean you have some extra people to help you if you do get into a war, and it also might mean that you might get dragged into one of your allies' wars, which can often be a good way for you to grab some extra land off somebody that you wouldn't normally have been able to fight. So this is probably going to be one of the longest videos in the series because it's just trying to explain so much about the start of the game. In the next video, I'm going to go through and have a look at some of the uh, map modes just so I can explain to you guys a little bit more about the sort of information that the game can feed back to you. And then after that, we'll get into some more of the in-game mechanics. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope you're still enjoying this tutorial series, and I'll see you on the next video. Until then, goodbye for now.